Neighborhood Association. We are the neighborhood association that represents downtown east and downtown west, um, which kind of covers a broad terrain from 12th Street to uh, going up to the river here, to the dome, and then up towards the uh, warehouse district. Um, I'm going to keep this really short and sweet from my perspective. Um, we have a group of neighborhood organizations that have gotten together to um, just host this event and uh, bring the information to you guys so you can all hear what's here and see what's happening. Um, David Tingem is here representing the Mill District Neighborhood Association. He helped us uh, coordinate getting this space. Thank you very much. Elliot Park, Lynn Rainier, are you here? Thanks, Lynn. Um, thank you. And then uh, Open Book graciously donated us the use of the room, and I'd like to introduce Joe Skifter just to kind of make a few words about what's happening here at Open Book. Joe, come on up. Well, on behalf of Open Book, I want to welcome you to the building. Uh, we are the home of three outstanding literary organizations, the Block Literary Center, Minnesota Center for Book Arts, and Milkweed Editions. They created Open Book in the late 90s to be their home um, in these three buildings along Washington Avenue. We are a nonprofit, and we our sole mission is to maintain and create a sustainable home for the literary arts in Minnesota into the future. Uh, we have many activities in the building. We're part art gallery, we're part educational center. On any given day during the summer, we have two to three hundred school children in the building from six to 16, taking bookmaking, literary art classes, and um, publishing classes. So you should enjoy the building. It's a, open to the public seven days a week. So <coughs> welcome again. Thanks, Joe. And then without further ado, I'm going to introduce our moderator for the evening, Dan Collison, who represents the um, East Downtown Council. Dan, come on up. Thank you. And I just feel compelled to give Joe and the Open Book another thank you for letting us use this space for free. I've personally leased space in the building, and there's fantastic meeting space, and with the coffee shop and restaurant, it is a winner and a real asset to the neighborhood. Well, good evening. I've served at the East Downtown Council for three years, largely doing membership, and a few months ago, the board invited me to serve as the president of the East Downtown Council. And for those of you who may not know, uh, this organization has been around since 1979, so the better part of 39 years creating economic vitality. And the membership is really quite diverse from, sing I'm serious about this, just single person web designers and people who run grocery stores and restaurants all the way up to large construction companies and multinational corporations. And that kind of diversity has created new energy in our business forums and the way that we communicate and learn about the best things that are helping this side of town to be really thriving economically. With over 50 organizations and honestly more coming almost every month because of forums like this and opportunities that are unfolding, it's been an energizing time to even re-envision what the East Downtown Council can become for this part of the city. We have taken time in the last few months to really review the profile of business associations within a five mile range of the downtown to find out what our unique niche would be and to really become an asset to the neighborhood organizations that are creating also vital residential experiences. So that's our desire, to become a partner to you. And in one of my one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, it was with Council Member Goodman who I asked her, well, what should we do at this time where we're seeing billions of dollars from rolling into our district? And she said, well, lean into what you do well and do it a little better even. And for her, that is building value through initiatives, be a critical source of information. And this last one I like, and it's why we're even here tonight, convene all of the parts of our district for the common good. And so I thank you for coming tonight. The East Downtown Council, we have 15 board chairs from multiple organizations, arts, medical, industrial, construction. We are glad to be able to be at least a part of what is envisioning and taking place. Now in one sense, tonight's forum is simply due process. 
and how development takes place, getting input from the neighborhoods, getting input from people who will be a part of what's unfolding. But in another sense, tonight's forum is unique in history because this district has never seen such a catalytic and combined effort at one moment in time. And I just want to lay that out to you, that if, if both of these things happen, and we know what is, but if both of them happen, we can see 16 contiguous city blocks be completely redeveloped at the same time in the heart of the East Downtown and Elliott Park District. As many as 10,000 construction workers descending on the district for the next three to five years. That's staggering. Nearly $1.4 billion worth of development, which if you're paying attention is catalyzing a lot more interest, perhaps in the hundreds of millions. And the combined project will create two and a half to three million new square feet of space being used from everything from entertainment to office space to retail to housing next to what Mayor Rybeck says could be the most important light rail transit hub in the city, maybe the region. So there is a lot at stake. And our sense is everybody wants to get this right. <laughs> this is a once in a century type moment. And there is a sense that everybody involved from the developers the investors, to the city leaders, to the neighborhoods, we want to get it right. So in a sense, there is a legacy at stake and why tonight is that important. One piece of housekeeping before we get into the forum. Um, Riot Companies would love to know uh, your presence here and if you would like updates and communication from them, they have a piece of paper that they are going to be circulating around that will just request for preferred contact information. Of course, it's optional. But it is one way for them to be in communication with you about the information that they're going to be presenting tonight. Now the format is simple. We're going to get an update uh, regarding the People's Stadium first and do a question and answer. And then second, representatives from Ryan Companies will preview the East Village redevelopment proposal for the Star Tribune properties, followed by another question and answer. And I guess what I would like to say is we're going to feel our way through this a little bit. Um, the idea is they will do the presentation, they will do Q&A. Um, if there is a point at which they are looking for answers or questions, we may dig into that a little bit sooner. We do want to make sure tonight that we give a special amount of attention to the Ryan Company's project. So if I step in and kind of am the moderator in the sense of mean person, <laughs> that's just because I want to make sure that we've got enough time to dig into the Ryan proposal, which is the newer part of this whole unfolding combination of development projects. Okay, well the first presentation is from Michelle Kel Helgen, the chair of the Minnesota Sports Facility Authority. And for those of you that don't know, she was, prior to this, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Legislative Affairs at the Office of Governor Mark Dayton. And before that, she was Chief of Staff at the Minnesota State Senate. So I like to say, hail to the Chief, as she comes and presents Stadium Update. Let's give her a welcome. very much. It's really great to see so many people interested and involved. And I find, you know, my, my job is to chair the authority, but I spend a lot of my time meeting with neighborhood groups, uh, large and small business associations. I find there's a lot of questions, some concerns about the stadium and how things are going to unfold. And the more we can meet and talk and actually work together to make sure that it, it's done in the right way from a development standpoint, I think the better off we are. So thank you all for coming tonight. With that, I do know there are some chairs here for folks who have come in. If we're going to be here an hour and a half, you might want to sit down. Um, so we're going to do this. Uh, Tiffany Orth, who's our project coordinator, is always a good uh, contact for things happening at the authority as well if anyone um, needs information to be passed along or, or questions. So she's here with me tonight and I really appreciate that. I think most people have seen renderings of the new stadium. I just point out as this sits, um, you've got the ETFE roof um, on it that really covers that it's about 60% of the stadium. And we'll talk a little bit about this design because in addition to, I believe, it is architecturally a really interesting addition to the Minneapolis skyline and to the Minneapolis 
uh, already beautiful architecture that's in our city. It also is just a really, really efficient uh, design from a functional standpoint, which I think is, is really important. And this, as you look, is kind of the, the peak. It's, it's designed to shed snow. It's designed to have a really light, efficient roof structure. And it's kind of our version of our Minnesota retractable roof, if you will, from the standpoint that with these large doors that open to the west side, to the plaza, kind of the downtown side of, of the development. It lets air in, you definitely get the feel of being outside as you sit in the dome. And then with that roof, and as you can see, there's actually a 20 foot, we call it, it's a clear story glass that surrounds the entire thing. So in addition to 60% of the roof having this transparent fabric, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that really is, there also is that 20 story clear glass around it. So this stadium just has a lot of light uh, that's led into it, so I think that'll make a big difference. Um, the one thing that we always talk about is it really needs to be connected to the neighborhoods. It's got to be part of the fabric of the Minneapolis community, and that really is what we have tried to do. Uh, the connection to the outdoors in this sort of climate-controlled environment, I think, is, is a big plus for the facility. And then these five front doors, which actually is the largest pivoting doors in the world. They're somewhere around 80 to 90 feet tall, and they're 40 to 50 feet wide. And so it covers a space of around 250 feet across. They actually go up. They're going to... The, when you think about it, the 90 feet tall doors will go beyond just the first floor. So actually when you're sitting in the second level of the bowl, those doors will be open so you'll feel a lot of air even higher up in the stands because the doors are so tall. We sit on a 33 acre site, which basically is the same site that the Metrodome sits on. However, we always do point out this is a much larger building. It essentially is 1.6 million square feet. The current <coughs> Metrodome is right around 975,000 square feet. So it's more than half again as large as the current Metrodome. What that really means is we're going to have a lot more public space in this stadium because the number of seats in this stadium 65,000 is actually the same number of seats that are in the current Metrodome. It is expandable to like 73,000 for the Super Bowl, Final Four, some of those big events we hope to attract. But the number of seats actually is similar to the Metrodome. But what it includes is just a lot more public space. And I think it's going to be a huge community resource in many ways because of that. Um, people always talk about why do you think this, this stadium is going to make any economic development difference to this area when clearly the Metrodome has frankly been kind of a disaster from an economic development sense. What I always point out is, and we were, I was talking with David Fields earlier tonight, the city, I think, did an amazing job in putting together this implementation committee that is this very broad, it's like 33 members, all neighborhood groups, many business associations, uh, city staff, elected officials are all represented on this group. And there's a number of architects on, in this group who have been really involved in putting together our design. But the thing that they impressed upon us from day one is, unlike the Metrodome, which really sits as this kind of isolated blob in the city with fences and roads around it, it's really hard to walk to, everyone said, you can't see in the Metrodome. Nobody knows what's going on. There is no transparency. So the design we came up with, with all the glass and the sort of openness and really what we call forefront doors, when we get to the design, I'll show you. There is the, the large plaza in the front, 
But there are linear parks that surround this entire facility, and they're literally our four front doors. And we want to be connected to, in a very real way, to Elliott Park, to the river, to the downtown, obviously, but even across the freeway to Cedar Riverside. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And the way this building is designed, it's meant to attract development. It's meant to have people want to gather there, to spend time there, which I think is going to prove to be a great economic development stimulus. I think already it's been borne out when you hear about the Ryan development, which is coming, you know, just based on people are going to want to be part of this, and that's really important. Um, The, so, this essentially gives you a sense of what we're talking about. Um, a big piece of this is, you obviously, you've got the stadium. I should mention, we actually are going to be closing 5th Street there. The, the freeway exit, as you come off on 5th Street, will stay open. You can go either way on 11th Avenue. And the city and the county have actually determined that they're going to have a contraflow lane on 6th Street. So you will have one lane of traffic that actually goes toward the city on 6th Street. But essentially, we do have, as I mentioned, the building is a lot bigger. So in addition to going back on the site, obviously that parking lot in the back will be gone. In addition to that, it's a much wider building. So we come all the way over to 5th Street, and that gives us more space. What we're talking about is the, the area right around the stadium sitting on our site without ever moving across the street is actually we've got a park plaza area which is 2.7 acres right in front. And just to give you a little perspective for those of you who've been over to Target Field, that plaza space around Target Field is right around 2.5 acres. So this is going to be a very, just right on our own property, we have about, um, I believe it's about seven acres of these linear parks. And this area alone is 2.7 acres, just to give you some sense of scale. Then what we're doing is the authority will also um, purchase, our plan is to purchase this block, which is where that transit station sits. This is the light rail that comes through here. So there's a transit station that sits there. This would be the first block of what would be considered to be the park plaza. And then I think most of you have heard about the fact that the city is looking at this two block park that would be added with our block. This whole thing would be well over seven acres um, of park plaza space. And again, we'll have a little comparison as we go to give you a sense. This is Bryan Park in New York. So any of you who've ever been to New York, if you've been to Bryan Park, Bryan Park is right around seven acres. So our park area actually is a little larger than Bryan Park in New York. It's going to be phenomenal space. This is a view of Bryan Park at night. And if you think about our park plaza, especially in the wintertime, you know, you could see a lot of these temporary structures that could come up and could even be heated. There could be on that back block, you could have um, a skating rink, you could do um, cross-country skiing around these seven blocks in addition to the stadium, so seven acres, along with the acreage available at the stadium site, it could be really significant. So this gives you, as I mentioned, a little better sense. So this is the stadium as it sits on this site. And I mentioned the fact that it really has kind of four front doors. So this is the area, just for perspective, we're sitting here on the south side by Elliott Park. So there's a major entrance here. Obviously, these are these big tall glass doors that open to this plaza. And then this is the side by the river. There's a major entrance there. And then right here, which is the freeway side of the building, there's this really cool linear park with these kind of um, handicapped
handicapped accessible, sort of this slatted park that goes down. Any of you who know Tom Osland, who's a local architect who's done a lot of really major things in the city, is our landscape architect on this project. He's got, this is, this is a, a plaza. It actually has stairs just very gradually coming up on the plaza. And then there'll be these really dense bosques of trees, essentially, on either side. So a big one here and a big one over there. And then, as I mentioned, these kind of linear park spaces all surrounding the stadium. There'll be bike trails and walking trails around the entire stadium, so people will be able to move <coughs> around. This is a view from uh, the Guthrie side, the river side of the stadium, just to kind of give you perspective of these kind of tree mosques along the side. And this shows you on the front plaza, the sort of gradual steps coming up to the stadium. And again, this is all on this side of Chicago Avenue. So it's before you cross over to that transit block, which begins this large, park plaza space. This is just the space in front of it. And this, as you see, is this kind of very dense tree bosque that's going to be on both sides of the stadium. And this is a view, actually, as you walk up um, to the stadium. There's going to be trees lining the entire, uh, the entire space as you go down through on 6th Street. And this gives you a little sense of these. There's going to be concrete walls that are done with some Minnesota stone all along. But everything will be very accessible and inviting. So you've got the stadium kind of here on this side. And then you've got all these linear park spaces over here. And this is kind of a winter view of what we might be doing. <laughs> So this again, you know, just talks about the points of access. It talks about the tree bosques. It talks about um, connections to bicycle paths at the Hiawatha Trail back here. It really will be a much friendlier uh, approach as you come to the stadium. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the interior of the stadium. One of the big things about the new stadium is it versus the Metrodome. For any of you who've been in the Metrodome, you come in, there's very tight, narrow hallways. You don't look into the bowl, except when you go down to your seat, you can't even see the seating bowl. It's all just concrete walls around the whole thing. This is going to have an open bowl design. So when you walk into that stadium, you're going to see the entire open bowl. For those of you, and I do recognize a few people that I saw through the winter, uh, one of the things we do in the stadium, and we'll talk about all the other events that are held there, but one of the things that we do is people come and pay all winter long, four nights a week, even when there's events being held in the stadium, as long as they aren't you know, huge crowds. We allow people to come in, they pay a dollar, and they rollerblade. You can rent rollerblades, you pay a dollar, and you can roll a blade around the concourse. And when I went out, we did uh, listening sessions to say to people, what do you want to make sure we do in the new stadium? What should be done differently? What should we do? That was probably the biggest single group of people who showed up to say, uh, we, our family, uh, the, the upper concourse are like the really fast, serious, like, those people are there for the exercise aspect or the uh, competition aspect. They, they fly. But the lower floor are families and, you know, sort of people like me that just sort of putter out. It is amazing. And now the new stadium definitely will be accommodated for the rollerbladers. And for these people to have this beautiful view and to be able to experience this stadium, I think is going to be really cool. Um, large public spaces. I mean, it's just going to be a whole different feel than what we have now. There's going to be two of the largest end zone video boards in any NFL stadiums. There'll be seven levels with stairs, escalators, and actually a ramp that kind of surrounds it that people can, that not only makes it handicapped accessible, but also kind of an easy way to get up and down. And as I mentioned, the transparent open structure 
to really connect us to the outdoors. Um, clear is the new retractable, is at least what we're telling people. <laughs> this is, uh, this is the, the roof, and it really does, as you sit inside, you can actually see sky, clouds, I mean, it is definitely going to feel like you are sitting outside. On the other hand, I always tell people not to worry. There is a steel structure beneath this whole thing, unlike the air-inflated uh, Metrodome, which we did have a few problems with our roof coming down. There's no worry of that happening again. This ETFE uh, fabric is always, people always ask, like, what, what really is this? And so I brought along two pieces. Now I want to say one of the things that we do with this fabric is they put a fritting pattern on it because that one of the, it while it lets light in in the winter and it's got incredible heating properties, you also want to be careful in the summer that it doesn't get too hot and your air conditioning bills don't get too high. So this fritting actually deflects. The, the sunlight to a certain extent so that it doesn't get too hot. Now the pattern that we have, I'm going to pass that around, the pattern that we have is going to be less dense than what we'll send the side. Less dense than what that is. It'll be about 50% because if it gets too dense you can't really see through it. But it's just kind of interesting to see what it really is. This has been used a lot in Europe. The other question I get as well, this really has never been done here, certainly not in a stadium, and how is this really going to work? It's been used in Europe for literally over 30 years, and it's very durable. Um, it's got uh, great durability properties, and it also is essentially self-cleaning. And with the pitch of the roof, and the, the water, and the way it sheds snow, I think it's going to be a really efficient uh, fabric. This, well, that's it, but there's layers of it. It'll be, it'll be done in layers, but that actually is the fabric, yes, or the, the material. No, no, ask as we go. I'm very flexible, so at the time, I think it makes sense to just ask. So this is probably, this is in New Zealand. This is probably the largest uh, example. This is a soccer field that has this ETFE fabric, and this uh, field has been around for about 17 years. This is an example of the video boards. On either end, there'll be two boards, um, and again, not just for NFL games, but for other events, I think this will be significant. And this gives you a sense of just the different levels and um, the different ribbon boards, and obviously this stadium is going to have quite a different feel to it. This is one example. This actually is the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, but there's going to be a few on the end zones, these end zone suites um, that are available to people, to companies and individuals, so that they can actually be real close to the action. And this also is, this is Lucas Oil Stadium, which our architects, by the way, did both Lucas Oil Stadium as well as the Cowboy Stadium. Two very different types of facilities and two very different looks. But this picture we put in there to just show the kind of open concourses that are going to be available and the sort of gathering spaces for people. You know, especially for some of these events that we hold, whether it's the Final Four or a football game, or even some of the college baseball games, people love to be able to get up, move around, interact with each other, and that's what a lot of these spaces are going to allow. <clears throat> and this is another example of Lucas Oil Field and those sort of open concourses that they have available. But the thing I always point out, because everyone knows that the Vikings play at the Metrodome, and obviously they're, the Vikings are the major tenant, and they're the ones, frankly, that are allowing us to build this stadium. Because I just want to remind everyone, the state and the city combination is putting in $498 million, a very significant 
investment on the part of the taxpayers. We all own a piece of this stadium. It's significant. The team is putting in $477 million. In addition, however, the thing that I always point out that people sometimes don't think about, they pay over a million dollars per game in rent. So the state, I just remind people, we are the developer. We will own the state, will own and operate the stadium. However, the team will pay us over a million dollars a game. They play 10 games a year, two more if they make the playoffs. We're always hopeful that that happens. So we're looking at like right around $13 million that the team puts in from a run standpoint. And what that really allows us to do is have this beautiful stadium that's available really 350 days a year for all the other events that we hold in this stadium, many of which are high schools, colleges, and we're going to talk a little bit in community groups that use this stadium at a very reduced rate. So a lot of times people say, why would we ever subsidize that professional sport team? I always point out, in addition to all the other economic development benefits we get in terms of the kind of economic development and jobs that come from this stadium, it actually in many ways is the team subsidizing all our high school and college and community events, if you think about it that way. So what do we do here? So we've got 350 days, and here's how we program the Metrodome, and we have made sure that all these events will be accommodated in the new stadium. We play baseball games. This is high schools, colleges, not just the University of Minnesota, but it's community colleges, it's private schools, St. Thomas, McAllister, it's two-year institutions, it's schools from all over the state. We had over 450 baseball games played this spring in the Metrodome. Literally, we schedule those games starting at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we go literally all night. This is, this allows all of our schools to plan in the spring early baseball seasons and not have to worry about the weather. It allows our colleges and universities to not have to spend all kinds of money to travel to Texas and Florida and all these warm weather climates to play all their games. They can hold their home games here in Minnesota. It's fabulous. Soccer, we do the state high school soccer championships, both girls and boys every year. We do the football championships for the high school league, as well as countless numbers of local kids, baseball and football games that are played there, not only in the fall, but in the summer as well. We actually do a lot of marching band competitions. If you think about it, it's really hard to find spaces that are big enough to accommodate that. We do a lot of that kind of thing. And then community events. We do things like Hmong New Year, which is about a five-day event, and you get people from literally all over the country to come to celebrate that. Uh, the new stadium will attract a lot of major national and international events, which will be amazing for the economy of our state. We really think that we're going to be able to accommodate Big Ten championships, certainly the Super Bowl, the Final Four, not only the final games, but the preliminary rounds we hope to get in that schedule. I'm actually going for a meeting with the NCAA tomorrow in Indianapolis. Uh, major League Soccer, I think this new stadium is going to have a good chance of attracting a Major League Soccer team. That, if you think about it, that's 28 home games that would be played at this stadium, and that would be a huge economic boom to the city. National conventions, one of the things I'll point out when we run through these pictures, we've accommodated, by accommodating high school and college baseball, with these seats that retract on one side of the stadium, we are going to have one of the largest field footprints of any multi-purpose stadium in the country. This, if you think about it, is great for a lot of national conventions and trade shows and that kind of thing. Because if they want to have stadium seating and at the same time a very large footprint, 
being able to retract something like 50 rows of seats in order to accommodate that right field line for baseball, which was really important. Um, that will allow us this large footprint. Uh, concerts, major concerts, and hopefully some good World Cup matches could be played here as well. And these are just, this gives you a sense. See now, this side of the stadium, all these seats, all these 50 rows, retract up until, and they fold up into this side. And so that's what gives you this very large field space. And this was really important for the authority. This is one of the things that we really felt obligated since our stadium had always accommodated these high school and college baseball games, that we would do that as well. And the team was agreeable to allow us to figure out a design that would accommodate that. Michelle, is the other side retractable also? No, no. And that was kind of the beauty of what we did. We kept it all on one side. And then a lot of all those levels, the, the one side of the stadium, then really is where all that those amenities go on the other side. So the one side of the stadium stays pretty um, straightforward there. So you can see, this is just an example of what uh, a potentially NCAA hockey game would look like with all the seating on the floor as well as up into the, the stands. And there you see those doors and the, the windows in the stadium. And this, I think, is the NCAA basketball vision. And this shows you what a soccer field, I mean, kind of ironically, we did all these accommodations for baseball, but it also gave us an incredibly great soccer field as well. Now, Major League Soccer has never been played in an indoor stadium as a home field, but we believe, and we'll, we'll see if they agree with us, with these doors that open, as well as that ETFE roof, we think we stand a good chance of attracting a team. And then concerts, obviously. And still we'll do our dirt events. A lot of families love the, the motocross and the monster trucks, and uh, that's always been a big part of the Metrodome, and we'll still accommodate that. Now, the thing we keep in mind, and this really was a big part of the reason that the city and state did also put that money in, the jobs that are created by this project, I mean, it's staggering. 7,500 jobs in all these trade areas are going to be required for this stadium. As well as the ongoing jobs that will come from this big stadium and all the events we'll host through the year. We have some very aggressive project equity goals that we've adopted that the city of Minneapolis put out there. Of those 7,500 workers that we're going to be hiring, 32% will be minority, 6% will be women. There also will be targeted businesses of 20% that will include 11% women-owned firms and 9% minority-owned firms. However, one of the things that our board actually decided was a high priority. We obviously want to meet these goals, but it will all be done with Minnesota-owned firms and Minnesota workers. We would rather miss those goals by you know, a small percentage and keep it all with Minnesota businesses and Minnesota workers. Because obviously, you know, just bringing a bunch of people in from out of state to meet some goals is not what this project is about. It's about Minnesota workers, and it's about Minnesota businesses. We feel very certain that we're going to be able to meet these goals. We've hired an equity manager. His name is Alex Tittle, and he actually starts July 1st. We've got uh, an RFP out for an employment and training firm that's going to be doing outreach into the community, not only for our targeted businesses, but for the targeted workforce. And we are absolutely committed, and we've got a very focused plan that will be put in place to allow us to meet those goals, because that clearly is important. A little bit on our schedule. So we're on track, and we're going to be built on time and on budget. 
So uh, we released the schematic design, and that's when we did that kind of unveiling at the Guthrie. That was done in May. We are holding uh, public listening sessions this summer, later this summer, starting in August. We're going to be going around the state with our architect to be able to show people what the stadium looks like, both inside and outside. And I obviously am doing a lot of meetings with many different groups. Uh, by fall, we'll have a guaranteed maximum price from our great construction firm, Mortensen Construction, which is doing the construction work. And then the 2014 and 15 season, we play, the last season will be played this fall in the Metrodome. And then we will break ground in October. The season will end, hopefully, the end of January after the playoff games. And then the building will be taken down and the construction will begin uh, in earnest. So two years, 2014-2015 seasons, the Vikings will play at TCF Stadium over at the University of Minnesota. And then in July 2016, the new stadium will open for that fall football season. And that's it. Question. So before Ryan comes, uh, are there a few questions for Michelle? Yes, sir. Michelle, you, you actually stated that the current Metrodome seats 65,000 and the new stadium will seat 65,000. What about the comparison on the suites? Um, the number of suites in the new stadium is right, I saw Jeff Anderson here. I know that the, the new stadium suites is right around 100 to 110 to start with. Do you know how many are in the Metrodome? About 87, 88 suites. Right? So there are more, but not a significant number more, but there are more. That's part of where you, you see some of that space, definitely. Okay. Question here. I'm going to bounce back and forth. Don't uh, do you expect any issues with shadows since it's self facing? You know, we did sun studies. Our architects, HKS, you know, they did the Dallas Cowboys Stadium in Indianapolis, Colts, Lucas Oil Field, which are both retractable. And they have significant sun, I wouldn't say issues, but there are, sun, you know, they definitely get shadows. And so um, the Vikings owners looked at this very carefully because they really were concerned and they did uh, an incredible number of sun studies that they watched and looked at and they determined that it wasn't going to be an issue. Part of that ETFE and that fritting pattern, it kind of diffuses the light to a certain extent. I mean you definitely see sky, clouds, that kind of thing, but it's a little more diffused than with just like straight glass, for example, and that certainly helps. The other thing is the issues aren't quite as great because you've got 60% of the roof and the way it goes it's almost, there's probably only 20% of the field that has a hard deck on it because all that, um, the, side, the side of the stadium, the south side that retracts is where the ETFE roof is and so a big part of that roof structure covers um, the the floor of the stadium essentially. So I think that will help a lot. And there is also this um, steel pattern that's there. And so by the time it's got the, the fritty dots, it's got the steel, and it's not quite completely transparent, I think by the time it, it actually hits the field, it doesn't seem to be that significant. But they definitely looked at it, and that was a key factor in the decision making and they felt like it would be fine. What about the noise level outside? Can, I'm sorry, you can just hand the microphone up. Oh, Thank you, sorry. sorry. Can you talk about TLK? The, the um, I know that the team is working with the city to put in place a tailgating plan per se. I mean, definitely this stadium is going to have more of an urban tailgating feel, if you will. Um, part of what we're doing with this whole park plaza space is to get people out of their cars and, you know, into that park with, 
a whole different kind of ambience and feel to it. So it's going to be a different sort of tailgating to a certain extent, and I know they're working with the city to determine where exactly cars can do the more traditional tailgating things, you know, within an area. But it would definitely, it's going to be controlled. I know the city, where is David? I know the implementation committee has what's called a stakeholder committee, and they are specifically looking at tailgating, and will put together a very specific tailgating plan. Are they doing it in that plaza area? Um, I mean, tailgating of, of kind, I mean, there'll be bands and people, and yes. But it's obviously you aren't going to have cars there. No, I don't know. They, whether they would bring in a grill, possibly, I'm not sure. We really haven't gotten that far. But they'll be on foot. Next question. What about the noise level outside the stadium, especially when the doors are open to the communities from? I mean, you know, it's, it's a stadium. It's definitely, I think with the Metrodome, um, I live downtown. I've been downtown for six years. And I actually live down by the post office, and I definitely hear the roar of the crowds even all the way down there. So I'm sure that sort of thing will continue with the stadium. You know, again, I think the good news, because we're sitting on the exact same footprint, everybody currently and coming knows what's there. It's nothing, there's, for 25 years, there's been a stadium there, so. I don't think it'll make that big of a difference because we kind of know what it is we're dealing with. Great. Uh, a question back there, and then here, and then we've got to move to the Ryan. But hold, there's a lot of great questions here. And I'll we'll stay. We can next one. answer Have you I just want to make sure we finish at 8 o'clock. Yes. The Ryan's got a great proposal. Yep. Have you thought about the bird issue? I envision a lot of birds flying into a 90-foot sheet of glass. Yeah, we actually have met with the Audubon Society. Part of what we're looking at is this whole fritting pattern that, that is done. In addition to deflecting the light in the roof, that also is the way you take care of that, that bird issue as well. They're talking with us a lot about a lot of lighting and turning out the lights at night and not leaving lights on like after midnight, which apparently it's that light that birds are attracted to. They're talking to us about downlighting rather than uplighting, and there's quite a variety of things that we're looking at. But we have met with them, and we are working with them to try to make sure we lessen the impact. Great. Last question. During the destruction phase, what is the city going to do to protect the buildings around? To protect the buildings around? Well, Mortensen really is the construction firm will be the ones who will deal with that specifically. And they've got a great deal of experience given all the, the work they've done. Target Field, which Mortensen worked on, is probably the best example because that sits in the middle of a much tighter configuration with many buildings around it and they didn't have any problems. I'll be here afterwards great. as well. Thank you so much for this part of the <laughs> Company. Uh, Rick Collins is the Vice President of Development. He's worked with Ryan Companies for more than 14 years, specializing in commercial real estate projects. But he's a 28-year veteran in the area of commercial development and has played a number of roles in the city and the region. Uh, the other presenter is Mike Ryan, who's a fourth-generation member of the Ryan family and Director of Architecture and Engineering for Ryan Companies United States. Prior to his role, Mike was a project manager and architect for the esteemed Robert A. M. Stern Architects in Manhattan, New York. Currently, Mike is uh, the lead architectural design person at the 222 Henneman Project, which is mixed-use multifamily development on Hennepin Avenue. So I'm going to turn it over to Rick and to Mike. And once again, they'll do a presentation, and then we'll have questions directed to this. And any time left over, we can talk about how they work together. At great risk, uh, I'm going to speak without a microphone. And by the way, for those of you in the back, I'd make the same offer Michelle did. Come on forward. There's about half a dozen seats here if you'd like to, if you feel more comfortable. Uh, again, I'm Rick Collins. 
Uh, my voice has carried far enough over the years to get me in trouble plenty of times. But if you can't hear me, let, let me know. I'd like the same way, and we'd be happy to use the microphone. Um, I'm going to tell you just a few opening comments about our proposed development. And then Mike's going to spend most of our time with you on design. But then we'll both be happy to stand for questions at the end. Michelle Kell Helgen told you an awful lot about a beautiful stadium. We are so excited to be a part of this development in downtown East and helping to transform the downtown East neighborhood. But I think it's worthwhile to review what we have. Today we start with a stadium, with a plaza, and parking. And all of that is provided for in the legislation that was passed by our legislature last year. And to, to that, we are adding about $350 million worth of private investment that includes 300 to 350 new housing units, brings somewhere near 500 residents to the neighborhood, another five to 6,000 downtown jobs in a million square feet of office space, and very important connections between the stadium and the core. You'll see uh, on the diagrams that Mike shares with you how our skyway connects from the stadium through our proposed development into the downtown core. And candidly, without that Skyway connection, some of the very major national and international events that you heard Michelle Kelhelkin talk about would be much more challenging to attract. But with that Skyway connection, we have connections to downtown restaurants, hotels, additional parking facilities, etc. So the Skyway is a very important part of our proposal. About three and a half million dollars of new annual taxes from this site, of which about a million dollars would go to Minneapolis and we have an opportunity for a world-class urban park. You've already heard Michelle talk about it, Mike will talk in a little greater depth, and again, we'd be happy to stand for your questions at the end. Before we go any further, one of our colleagues is here with us as well, Tony Barranco. Some of you probably know Tony, he's a neighbor of yours. Uh, Tony and his wife bought in the Humboldt Lofts back in 2002, and he currently serves as president of the Humboldt Lofts Ownership, what is it, Home Ownership Association? And he was kind enough to come along tonight and uh, help us take some notes. And uh, so we appreciate Tony being here. With that, I'll turn it over to Mike Brown. Perfect. Josh, you want to stand up quickly? I'll just introduce Josh Ekstrand as well. If you like some of the images, the renderings, and videos you see, thank Josh yeah, for it. If you don't, uh, Josh had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and then I just want to thank whoever kicked on the air because that made it great. Uh, I'm going to walk through a series of diagrams uh, and really try to explain what we're trying to propose here uh, and what the project is. So without further ado, we are all familiar with this image. This was taken about uh, six months ago from the top of the Capella Tower. Uh, and of course you see the Metrodome in that space. Now, we all know that there's a major public investment coming from the beautiful and crudely rendered stadium here. Uh, and then the light rail, let's not forget about that, is another major public infrastructure investment that's been going on, uh, transects this site and connects downtown to St. Paul Airport, et cetera. Uh, our goal is to leverage those two major investments uh, with the development that many of you have seen. Now, the first thing that we think is most important over here to sort of eradicate this uh, long history of the sea of parking in this neighborhood is to connect from the core to the front door of the stadium. Our proposal is not a phased proposal. We want to try to do this all at once. Uh, so that's where the park comes in. East-West Running Park really establishes this pedestrian connection from day one. Uh, so of course, we know what those parks would look like. Uh, the second element that we're dealing with is the uh, parking ramps. There are going to be several parking ramps built for any development. There are more being built here because of the stadium. So how do you take those ramps, hide them within buildings to the best of your ability, and really get a nice pedestrian escape? Uh, so again, these are some of the things we don't want to see. We want to see smart development that really wraps those ramps. Uh, then we're going to take that park and those ramps and really do what Chicago did with Millennium, what New York City did with Central, and create this great development spline that you can build upon. Now that park is what draws the development. The development sort of sits really gracefully in front of us because of course it's a park. Uh, from there we've taken uh, our proposed bill has done one other thing that we think is pretty unique and interesting, and that's to uh, small pods that you put up, Michelle, I'm going to use your laser pointer, uh, are all residential uh, units with retail below them. And that will really give that park a 24 hour sense of place, not just an eight hour business day, right? So think of the business day ending, people come home, they go to the restaurants that 
really creates that safe environment, much like Mears Park has. Now, Rittenhouse Square is another famous sort of residential park. Uh, we think we're going to get the best of both worlds. Uh, again, a couple of other just images of what residential on a park and cafes feel like. And then this is the rendering that's been out in the newspapers uh, of a winter uh, image. Again, that's that same photo from six months ago with the new stadium that Michelle just showed, rendered in. Uh, and we'll get into talking a bit more about uh, all the details of this. Josh, you want to click on the fly around. We're going to uh, quickly do a fly through animation just to get a better sense of how this all comes together and looks. And then we'll go into some of the details. So there was the rendering we were just looking at. And now it's going to change into a, a model that we're going to pan around it. So now you can see you're heading out to the southwest. The armory is going to have a major presence on the park. Uh, the two buildings on the left there are the uh, proposed office buildings. And then the third block you can see is the parking ramp. Now this is the model of the stadium uh, as it's designed today. So you can really see that the park has a great relationship with the stadium. Josh, I want to pause it here when we get to the rendering. All right, so this is a shot from just uh, about six months ago as well of the city from the Metrodome, and now you're about up on the upper concourse level. So this, imagine, is what you're looking out those great glass windows looking down at. Now, a few things that we think are really significant is, first of all, the city skyline and City Hall in particular uh, become the sort of edge of the park. That's really, you know, we didn't plan that. It happened, but we thought about it. <laughs> We didn't plan for City Hall to be put there. Uh, the light rail is existing in this location today. We're simply proposing that the green, uh, that block is connected to the other two. Uh, on the right, you can see some of that residential. Uh, here, the residential is covering a parking garage. In these buildings, it's, it's sitting in front of the office buildings so that the office buildings set back, give a little reprieve, and get that nice neighborhood setting. And then, of course, the armory. Uh, which none of us know exactly what the armory is going to turn into, but I think it's safe to assume if this happens, it's going to turn into something great. Josh, go to the next one. Here. We're going to see this thing transform into sort of an evening, a nighttime shot. This is where those residences become really important, right? Now you've got people at home looking out at the park that really adds a level of security. So, of course, summertime, again, you have a great skyline uh, presence on the park. Uh, really dramatic and an iconic, you know, new sort of shot of Twin Cities. Go ahead, John. Okay, now we're going to zoom back up and ultimately land back in the Pella. So there you can see those residences. The office towers actually come down and have plazas and entry courts around the park. Now on the north side of these, you're going to see some U-shaped residential. Uh, that's where another 200 units are located. Uh, so again, it adds just a nice scale as you look at Okay, so that is, uh, we're going to stop here, and that's the final rendering is the, uh, it's a game day setting. So you can see, of course, we would envision, envision, and we just have one opinion here, that it becomes this dynamic game day festival experience. It's really unparalleled in, uh, in the NFL. There is nothing quite like that. So it's really a unique opportunity. And we've often called this the, the bloom shot. Uh, you know, this is what gets, gets broadcast out to the rest of the country, right, and the rest of the world. Uh, we're pretty inspired by this, and we think it's a great brand for the city to be able to show this sort of great green and positive momentum. All right, so let's go back to the presentation, Jack. Okay, so I won't spend much time on this, but again, we're all familiar with the site as it lays out in aerial. Uh, this is the new site uh, with the Viking Stadium proposal, uh, the plaza uh, and park that we are showing the east-west running, and then the three blocks of mixed use. Now Rick alluded to this earlier, but the blue maps out where Skyway exists. And right here at the off ramp, we have this great opportunity to connect right across the front, in front of those three buildings, very similar to how Target and the Retech building and US Bank work, and then connect all the way to the stadium, which really enhances its usability. Mike, uh, just one point. These two parking ramps, uh, totaling about 1,735 parking stalls, and these skyways are all that Ryan has proposed to the MSFA. So this is our proposal. We have not yet ironed out all the details, uh, which would include things like skyway alignment and other things, but I just wanted to make that point. No, that's that's a great point. <laughs> so again, this ramp and that ramp are being built as 
part of the stadium legislation. This is our proposal to go with that. Uh, okay, so we talked about this idea of creating public space. We're going to show at least what our version of that would look like uh, because we've spent quite some time on this. Two parks Michelle mentioned, uh, Bryant Park in New York is about six acres, and Millennium Park in Chicago is about 12. Those are two really good examples for many reasons, but those scales are important because uh, what the mayor has termed as the yard, this plaza, is about nine acres, so right between those two sizes. Just for example, that's the size of the scale of the yard. These are all famous parks shown at the same scale. Uh, here is Rice Park in St. Paul, Mears Park, the Northbrook Mall, Bryant Park, there's Millennium, which we've pointed out, our own Warren Park, Boston Common, very similar scales, and then Central Park. So that should give you an idea, this is a large, large urban park. This is not Central Park. It's very different. Bryant Park and Millennium are the two best you need to keep in mind when you're trying to quantify the scale. Uh, the road closure that we propose has become somewhat controversial. Uh, I think it's quite clear what our position would be. We just think it would make a better park. That's really our only motive in closing the roads. Uh, Millennium does terminate uh, several roads into it with over 10,000 car traffic counts a day. Central Park, of course, terminates about 60 roads, uh, and I think four of them run through. And those roads have you know, close to 15,000 cars a day. Uh, we are proposing Portland and Park be shut down. Uh, those are about 6,000 cars. Mike, could you go back to Central and point out the hospital presence? Yeah, uh, what we have highlighted in yellow are the hospitals at or near the park that would uh, have similar road closures. <coughs> things to navigate And then, of course, HEMC is going to be a neighbor of this uh, site. And it's currently a strong presence here, so that, uh, that's one of the uh, potential conflicts with closing the doors. OK, just for a height comparison, this is uh, Wells Fargo Tower. This is Capella. As you step down, this is City Hall, 345 feet. The two large buildings that we are proposing are 304. We think it's important in sort of just a hierarchical relationship. They're shorter. And then the stadium brow, which is quite tall for stadium, that's about 272 feet. So that's just a section cutting through those blocks. In terms of use for the park, we have this summer view rendered. Of course, we picture the sort of tranquil park everyone would imagine mm -hmm. on a summer day. Uh, plenty of business users out there, neighborhood users, etc. Uh, but then one of the critical elements to closing the roads is to create a large enough space to do outdoor sporting events. So by closing Portland in particular, you can get uh, full size, uh, you know, uh, accurate size fields. You can program high school sports uh, and intramural sports, you sports, that sort of thing. Uh, at night, I think it's pretty easy to imagine what would go on out there, movies in the park. It's a great image that really feels like a rendering of the park, but it's actually a photo, uh, I believe, from Denver. And just some other festivals like activities you can imagine out there. Game day, I think we can all have an idea of what game day would look like. And then in the winter, you've also got some great opportunities, first of all, for ice skating rinks out there, also for sliding hills, really. As many you imagine an active sport out there, cross country skiing, uh, you can set up a pretty uh, substantial track out there and have a great cross country ski trail. So we really envision this as an incredible motivator for downtown living experience. And then some of the other events you can, you can imagine out there. Sustainability, uh, and particularly as it relates to smart stormwater, becomes an issue uh, with all these, with any development in an urban area. But I think what's unique here is that you know, what we're proposing is taking a six block area, turning two blocks into a park. So that's going to have about the smartest stormwater strategy you can get. Uh, but then really incorporating some other smart techniques like, you can't see this image, it's so small, but uh, rain gardens, so a typical uh, sidewalk planter, but that actually acts like a bathtub in a storm, sucks water off so it doesn't end up in the river. Uh, and so that's what we would envision along the street frontages of, of these various blocks. Okay, just in terms of some of the street skate, uh, I can try to give you some perspective. We talked earlier about the office buildings being set back, so you have some very large plazas here in front of those office buildings. Uh, that's very similar to, let's say, the Comcast headquarters, maybe the U.S. Bank headquarters. Uh, you get a really nice, about a 45-foot space uh, out there. That is truly a plaza-like space. And then the sidewalks in front of the residential buildings, 
we envision these much like the photos on the left or on your right. Uh, a ground floor retail, four stories of apartment above, so five story buildings really adding that sort of charming park like uh, setting. And then, of course, whenever you develop two sides of the street, it's a unique opportunity to actually plant an alley of trees. And you rarely get that opportunity in an urban environment because you're only doing one block. Uh, so, uh, plots like this can actually happen in this building. Uh, I'm going to cut a section through this building so that's like a, taking a little cake knife and just slicing that through. Uh, so, that's what you see here. This just gives you a sense of if you're down on the street, these buildings are going to be five stories tall. Uh, retail space opening out to them. The sidewalk there is about eight feet wider than a normal sidewalk, so you have that much extra space for patio and dining seating. Uh, and then, of course, your typical sidewalk with the rain gardens. Uh, tree canopy there, these trees are shown at about uh, 40, 50 feet. So real trees like in Central Park are 100 feet tall. So in 80 years, you know, these trees have yeah. Up here. Uh, but this is you know what it looks yeah, like in the first 20 years now. There's a shot of those rain gardens. They're really a smart, uh, sustainable approach, and they're quite attractive. And then this would be the sort of experience if you were walking on the park side, right? So over on this side of the street, where you're on the park sidewalk before entering into the park ground. Okay, I'm going to take some slices through the building so that we can all get a sense for the building as you go up. Uh, the first thought, I guess, is that uh, we've got some parking ramp that's exposed, particularly on this third block, and that's part of fulfilling the requirement to get parking close to the stadium. <coughs> what we've proposed there is this green screen, and this is a ramp in Uptown uh, at the Mosaic Building, if you're familiar with it, and that's after one year, so we think we can get a really attractive uh, side there, uh, skin on that parking ramp. Uh, the residential we've talked about. And then, now we're down on the first floor, what I want to highlight here is that these areas, high, uh, number four, these light blue, that's all ground floor retail. So really you almost have a continuous stretch of retail activation on the first floor. That's really important if you want an environment these. Uh, the only spot that that does not happen is when you get to the office entrance. So the area marked three, and that will look more like the image at the top. Right? So sort of some generous doors to set that <laughs> As you go up to the second level, that's where you see the Skyway coming through. So this is the existing off ramp. Uh, we propose to plug in uh, right here, and then you run pretty much a straight shot across to the stadium. Now what's important is that we have opportunities in that Skyway, uh, which is really good Skyway practice to offer people the opportunity to get down the street or up to the Skyway, also get the windows out. So you can see this whole stretch through here is open, uh, as well as this stretch, to so really get a good connection to the city. Uh, and then up above that fifth floor, when the residential stops, that's where the office starts. So again, that's set back, and you have your pretty typical 40,000 square foot office for the place up there. Uh, again, in both of those buildings. And then up on the top, there's a, a sort of a neat rooftop space up here with some outdoor uh, gardens, uh, roof terraces, and some great views of the city. You really get a sense of where you're at in the skyline. It's really a, a nice park down. On the north side, we talked uh, slightly about this, but here you can see some of that green fabric of the parking ramp. Uh, on the two buildings with the two blocks of the office buildings, that's where the U Corp residential is proposed. That's again five stories of residential. Uh, we are exploring options uh, for our corporate user that what if they want to expand here one day? Well, the scenario where they expand would look something like this. So in lieu of those apartments, we may do. Uh, office station. How many apartments do you have allocated to those buildings now? The, these uh, buildings in the back are about 200. 107 per block. So 200 total, 214. And then on the front side, you have about 85. Uh, these two blocks, uh, and then there's 60 over here. And, and apartments rather than condos, right? You know, we're not sure yet. Apartments is what we're thinking. Certainly, if you look around the markets, you see apartments uh, are clearly what it's like. And that would be our data. Go ahead. Over the past years, in looking at the river development and city development, we've sort of talked a lot about creating greater connection between the downtown and the river. Right. And it seems to me, looking at these buildings, that rather than 
I, I'm wondering whether there was any consideration you to connecting this part with the river. Yeah, it's because a great, it seems great like question. Barrier. And I haven't talked about this, so thank you for uh, pointing me in that direction. A couple of things, I want to find the best shot. Maybe this is it. Uh, to look at our these streets that will have the opportunity to develop both sides of the street will then also have that same opportunity to do the ballet of trees and sort of double canopy plant together. That will really enhance uh, Portland as you head toward the river. Now Portland is also the dead end of the, of the bridge. So we've created this gateway-like setting. These two towers sort of frame the entry and lead you to the bridge uh, entry. That's a really, I think, a special connection and the views through there. I don't have any images of it are really nice. Also on Chicago, similar case on Park. On Chicago, we have reserved a site over here. I don't know if anyone picked up on it in the site plan, but there is. There it is. Uh, we set back this other parking garage to create a pad site here for future development. That could be home to a hotel, a high-rise condo, an office building. I mean, it has many options. But that, again, is to sort of strengthen the Chicago connection, which is the now the connection from the Guthrie to the stadium down in there. Mike, could you go all the way back to the first floor layout? And I'd like to point something out on the uh, site plan. Oh. In fact, that was it right there. Uh, now, keep in mind, this particular uh, block is what we have proposed to the MSFA, as I was careful to point out earlier. So this is the development we have proposed, whereas we, we control these two blocks. We are proposing on this third block what may be done with, but you'll notice retail space that wraps the corner on Chicago as well. And that's all you can point out that development pad. Yeah. Like. So that's the pad I was talking about for future development. Uh, and that's the sort of hotel or condo. So this light blue does wrap Chicago's corner with the intention that the retail wraps around. And as long as you're there, can you point out the parking that is convertible? Yeah, so this bay of parking here, which would be parking on day one as we've proposed it is convertible to retail space. One of, the, one of the things you have to be careful with when you develop this much space is there's not this much demand for retail. Uh, but if this is all goes swimmingly and this becomes you know, the next great neighborhood of Minneapolis, you're going to want retail space here. So that whole bay is convertible. And that's actually a pretty good size space, about 10,000 square feet. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the barriers that exist from the whole little through the alley. You know, yeah, I'll get to that at the end. Why don't I wrap up the yeah. presentation and we'll dive into all of those and see the questions popping up as we go. All right, we just finished and we'll come back for our questions. Oh, close your eyes and make everyone sick here. I want the wrong way. <laughs> So 
we have a preliminary a significant interest from our corporate user. Uh, it's been reported accurately in the press that Wells Fargo is very interested in this project. They've not yet made any commitments. We have other hurdles to climb over that we're working actively with them and with the city and with the MSFA and others to make this all happen. But they are interested in owning one million square feet of office space on the site. Um, so that would take away the, the risk of office development for they to make such a commitment. And this is not just casual interest on their part. We're going back and forth with uh, agreement forms and that sort of thing. Um, we will be looking for city council conceptual approval in the first cycle in July, which means we'll be formally in front of the Minneapolis City Council on July 19th and various committees leading up to that, starting with the Community Development Committee on July 9th. And so we're actively in the midst of that. We're talking with the MSFA almost daily about our proposed contract uh, for skyways and parking ramps. And we're hopeful that we can uh, gain consent or assent with what we have proposed, which is not all of the parking that they require, but a significant portion of it in the next week or so. Uh, so that's subject to daily conversations making progress. We need to start a conversation about our park. We've acknowledged the uh, challenges with closure of the roads. We consistently propose the park as you've seen it tonight because we believe that's the best uh, long-term park uh, option for the city. And yet we know that there are many people that don't feel the same way necessarily and their voices will be heard. And ultimately the county commissioners will make a final decision. These are both county roads. And so uh, they've demonstrated their significant concern today. Um, and yet we continue to propose it, I suppose, to their consternation sometimes. Uh, we have to get through a very in-depth environmental review process. Some of you may be familiar with the term EIS. That, that means environmental impact statement. Well, we are doing an EIS-like review called an AUAR, which is an alternative area-wide urban alternative review. So it allows you to examine multiple alternative uh, development scenarios on one site. And so that's what we're doing. That should be completed by the end of November. And that really is the critical path item right now, is to get through that environmental review process so that at the end of November, we can get a city council approval of the environmental review. PUD, which is planned unit development, that's the method that we will use to get the city approvals of all of our uh, building sizes and densities and parking spaces, et cetera. And then also a financing plan for the park. I haven't gone into the financing plan. We'd be happy to talk more about it for the park, uh, but I think tonight we're focused on what this project would mean to the area. Our hope then would be that we would acquire the uh, five blocks at the end of December, begin remediation and demolition uh, early in the winter, and then start with a groundbreaking in April of 2014 and deliver in the last part of 2015 and early 2016, just in time for the Vikings, the people stating to open in July of 16. So we're on a very aggressive timetable. Um, we have spoken uh, to a number of you individually. We would love to have some demonstration of your community support if you feel so inclined. Uh, but we, more importantly, tonight we want to answer your questions. And there was a gentleman over here who is patient that I want to acknowledge. No, he Yes, sir. Is there a real demand beyond Wells Fargo? You've got a big block of commercial space there. And some space in various spots, 
most of it will be people that they will hire between now and the end of 2015 because they can't buy a building like this and then hire the first person to walk in the front door. All of this will be hired along the way, trained along the way so that they can relocate from somewhere. But substantially, growth, and they also have such a significant employee base that some of it will involve relocation and consolidation, but that will be ultimately their decision. As it relates to the retail, I'll be, I'll be to you in a moment. As it relates to the retail, I would agree with your assessment. Uh, downtown retail has been challenging. Um, we have about, we have space for retail, or for resident, I'm sorry, for restaurant on the ground floor of each of these buildings with five to 6,000 employees above. Skyway Connections in the downtown core and events, not just the biking games, but the 300 days a year of events, we think that we have a, a reasonable chance to get two successful restaurants in there. Beyond that, there's very minimal retail. It's really service retail for the employees above, so it's things like convenience stores. I'm sure you'll find a Wells Fargo branch bank there. Um, uh, fitness facilities, other things of that nature that are to help serve the employee base. So we are not interested in taking a great risk on retail. But we did want to make sure to build in some future retail opportunities because as the neighborhood continues to grow, we think there'll be more opportunity. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I, I might have. Dan, you want to? You want to? Yeah. Managing the questions. Um, why don't we go there? Um, what collaborative opportunities will there be for small business owners as it pertains to, like, well, for me, the residential component as a broker? Um, but what opportunities will there be for local owners to voice their opinions on? It's a condo, <laughs> as opposed to apartments. Great, do you want to nail that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll <laughs> no, no, I, uh, we, we're all ears. Yeah, <laughs> like you, we think that the market is likely to come back to the point where a certain uh, certain portion of this could be condominiums or townhomes and ownership, residential opportunity. We're already getting phone calls from individual buyers that would like to be here. Uh, but we have not even, the, the most critical path elements of this it really revolved around the corporate user, the financing plan, the MSFA parking <coughs> plan. And so we have not delved very deeply yet into the residential side of this. We're confident there will be the market, whether it's apartment or condominiums, but we want to work on that mix. And so, as Mike said, we literally are all ears here. I mean, this is not valuable just for you to hear what we're thinking, but it's valuable for us to hear what you're thinking. I think the only point I want to add to that is the park really changes the dynamic with the retail or the residential domain, right? I mean, think of Warren Park. There is a demand there because of the park. And that, that will change if we were to go through that out here with the service parking lots across the street. I'll take anyone with me. Okay. Thank you. I wonder if you'd mind taking a couple of minutes and filling us in on your research and new plans for traffic yes. flows within those within this area. And I'm, I'm assuming that you have looked at traffic studies so you know what kind of traffic patterns you presently and how that will change with your proposal? That is such a fair question, but we aren't yet to the point where we can share with you because we just began a traffic study about 45 days ago. Once we realized that this was progressing to the point where that environmental review process made sense to kick off, we are studying 42 intersections. So we'll be looking all around this area. Um, and there will be a public process as part of that AUAR I described where there will be near the end some uh, opportunities to both view the document and come and hear about it. Um, so we don't have all the answers yet. I mean, we, and, and believe me, if Wells Fargo locates here, they'll want to make sure that uh, their employees can get in and out. And we as marketers and residential want to make sure that any buyers or renters can get in and out as well. So we have every vested interest to make sure that this operates well, but we don't yet have the data. Questions over here? To dovetail that question, uh, which roads would actually be closed by the yard? Okay, the, the, for the yard, so what are you proposing? this is Park Avenue. Uh, Park Avenue would be substantially closed with an entry point from the uh, riverside to get into the underground parking ramp that's below the transit station. And we propose that Portland would be closed from 4th Street to 5th Street. That's the sum total of our proposals. Okay, back here. What are the elements that you've put are required to keep an urban park a safe place day and evening, and how are those addressed in this park? The, first of all, I think the smartest thing you can do is surround it with activity and people. And that's kind of 101 for safe parks. 
So that is really the goal behind the residential component on the park front, rather than just an office building. But with the office building user and the retail, now you've got sort of the three main users of the downtown space there, plus the fourth, which is the public entity, right? The stadium's here, let's not forget. Lots of people coming and going from that. So that's uh, item number one. And probably the most important because you can't affect that one half. The second one uh, is about how you program the park. I think anyone would tell you that, again, as long as you get activity there, it will remain safe. Uh, and so to that end, we haven't gone in and programmed how the park will operate. Because again, that's not really on our priority list of things to determine at this time. Because we're confident that this space can be transformed into a great park. Uh, I'll tell you the mayor's intentions for it is that it's active and used all the time. That will lead it to be a safe park, uh, and, and that's basically uh, our that's our strategy for addressing security. Go on one little other side, go back there. Yeah. I just wanted to know if both this proposal and the other the stadium proposal are they anywhere online where we could look at the photos that yeah. you're going to? Yeah. If you if you sign that document we sent around, uh -huh. we'd be happy to email you a link that will get you to our proposal. Okay, perfect. And how about is that still going around? Is, so, okay, well, let's make sure because we're going to wrap up in 120 seconds. That is by the exit. So if you want it, you can, you can grab it. Let's go with this gentleman here. Uh, sure. Uh, can we bring up a, well, you know, can I use the, uh, okay. the, the, the basics of the financing for the park are to leverage the parking revenue that's created on the proposed ramp on this block, the proposed ramp on this block, which we would both propose to construct for the uh, MSFA. And you heard Michelle Kell Melgan talk about um, uh, acquiring, that, that the uh, MSFA is actively seeking to acquire this block, which includes 455 underground parking spaces. Ryan has proposed to take the risk on what these parking ramps generate in terms of annual revenue and make 10 years of guaranteed payments to the city that total about $32 million. Candidly, that's because we think that they will uh, generate about $32 million of net operating profit over those 10 years. And that allows the city to pay the debt service for the ten, first 10 years on bonds for the park and for a portion of this parking ramp. Years 11 through 30, and, and by the way, Ryan's guarantee would not go away if we didn't have a minimum of two years of very excellent financial performance. So it could last for 11 or 12 or 20 or 30 years. We hope it'll be 10. Years 11 through 30 or after our guarantee goes away, the MSFA and the city are talking about how to split those parking revenues to make the, the uh, bond payments. Is that good there's enough no, for now? There's no tax increment financing involved in no. that? No. Now we'd be happy to use something. No. <laughs> Um, I, uh, this is fantastic. It is 8 o'clock and I want to honor everyone's time. So here's what we can do. Maybe if Ryan, you can come over here. Those who have some questions, you can just gather up here and keep kind of asking questions them. And Michelle, if you can be over here. And it could be a little noisy, but I really think these are very good questions. And they're here and can stay for a while after. Thank you for coming. Thank you.